Welcome back to the exciting new series of Mathematica with Nikolai. Today we'll consider extremely important SYK model and learn how to build huge gamma matrices and also solve some integral equations. This lecture is coordinated with uh, Lonti channel and please uh, see there the uh, lecture of Damien uh, who will give you some theory beyond SYK model I will concentrate mostly on the mathematical implementation and will try to keep it simple and self-contained. See this paper for notations. So we'll need to uh, program the Clifford algebra which is given by this relation and uh, we begin uh, from some small number of fermions or as a range of this index i and j which goes from 1 to n uh, and this n I will denote on Mathematica with this uh, fancy n. We'll start from, okay, pet 5 is not good. Maybe start from 6. Uh, to recall how I enter it is escape, ds, n, escape, right? And you see in escape mode, you just to remind, you can get access to lots of different fancy symbols. And I also introduce... Uh, this n over 2 because this will define the dimension of the representation. So this Clifford algebra, as you may know, uh, it has representation in the linear space of the size 2 to the n over 2. So that's why nc is useful. So first we define uh, creation and annihilation uh, operators. Uh, which are fermions, so these are anti-commutators. Uh, and for that, I first define uh, the case n equals 2. So, say, creation operator is 0, 1, 0, 0. And annihilation operator, oh, feel free to denote it in a better way. But... I have this stupid notation I entitled to. Um, and then I also will use uh, identity matrix 2 by 2. Well, I can also enter it uh, in explicit form. And I will also need a matrix, which is almost like identity with minus 1 to the left. Okay, because I'm going to use the formula for the uh, creation and annihilation operators uh, in uh, n dimensions, uh, which which is the following. So we'll have to take a certain number of copies of identity operator, then insert this two-dimensional creation operator, and then this identity two operators, um, and then compute tender product of them. Okay, more specifically, I want to uh, say n is a2. So I want to have n minus 1 identity operators. Then followed by a creation operator. Oops. And then maybe I should take it and make it a bit bigger for you guys. And then uh, this identity with minus 1 for how many times it will be uh, n c minus 1 minus n. So in total there are n, and I have to run this line, don't forget, I have n of them. So now I need to fix it, however, by doing this. Right, so n equals 2, uh, and maybe it's not big enough, so let's change bigger one so you can see what I'm doing. So you see first is this identity matrix, then uh, this is uh, my two-dimensional creation operator, and then followed by two copies of identity two with, with minus one on the first place. So because what I'm going to do now, I want to take these four matrices and compute uh, tensor product of them. So tensor product in Mathematica is Kronecker product. And I want, you know, so what it does, Kronecker product, let's check it out. So A, uh, B, C, 
ft and then say creation iterator so you see it it computes actual uh, tensor product between a b c d or i can multiply it by itself and this is the formula you expect for the tensor product of this matrix times itself right so now what i want to do i want to actually uh, create tender product of five of these matrices right so doesn't matter so what i want to do is to place this list of matrices inside the argument of Kronecker. so you see there are no like brackets like that so it's not applied to a list so i need to remove the list and replace the list header is a Kronecker product header so remember that if you have f of one and you want to replace f by g what you do is this double add symbol so that's exactly what we want to do we want to take our list right so it has a header list and re replace it with a header Kronecker product right that's exactly the same as just writing Kronecker product of these three arguments all right so what i'm going to do is just do add add as you can already guess and better to add some brackets for clarity so i have a list of five matrices now i want to fit them into the argument so instead of just applying chronicle product because then it would be chronicle product of a list i want chronicle product instead with five arguments and that's achieved by this double add okay so play with this double add to see how it works a little bit more so this will be my creation operator of n and i think it's ready to be extended i can now uh, n equal dot is just to clean whatever n was as usual someone tried to call me in the middle of the recording sorry about that and also i noticed that should be minus one here because in our case we need a list of five uh five of those matrices okay that's our creation and uh operator at the site n uh, or with the index i so this is just you see i maybe i should actually use notation c um and n is i in this case and c uh, dagger is this one and this instead of creation i have to do annihilation voila so now we can check that indeed they satisfy the correct algebra fingers crossed uh actually this anti-commutator so plus minus okay and we see a beautiful identity metric here voila so and we can also check the anti commute right so different side just to be on the safe side okay perfect you see so we defined in this way very simple uh the algebra of uh creation and annihilation operators um and and of such operators all right we're in um, in our case is five so now we can define fermions so fermion, fermion, so not to uh, annoy you with typing, I just uh, copy and I use different notations. So I just replace um, and that is our, this is our fermions, right? Um, and uh, those, the, you can check easily that as a consequence of, of course, creation and annihilation algebra, they will automatically satisfy the Clifford algebra like that. And actually I define um how many uh capital this fancy n number of fermions so the range uh first is nc for creation plus annihilation and then i have uh, um psi dagger um which gives me another nc so in total i have this fancy n number of fermions all right hope it's not too confusing i'm sure i already said it several times wrongly um all right so what's next next um uh, i want to actually just for uh, the, to make my code running faster i will want to define some binomial combinations of the fermions 
and I want to pre-compute them so I don't need to waste time uh, next. So of course it will take some memory, but I, I, I hope you guys got a decent machines for yourself. Um, voila. So yeah, it works pretty quick. And now we can look at one of them just to check it's not a total nonsense. Like identity metric section, but probably that's what it is. And this is more missing. Okay, dokie. So now we are ready to compute the Hamiltonian. And so actually, change of the plan. Before we continue, I noticed that our code is quite terrible, if not to say a stronger word. So if I start now doing say n equal fourteen, look at that. Look at how awful it is. Likely sure it never ends, right? So I'm trying to compute this uh, binomials and it takes enormous of time. So, okay. So now a simple observation that you see the spheremians. Something is nice about them is that they contain lots of zeros, right? Which means that uh, instead of storing the data about this matrix in the terms of actual matrix it would be easier to just say uh, where non-zero elements are and there is a way uh, to deal with this type of matrices it's called sparse array so what we need to do we just need to convert you know uh, this matrix we defined into a sparse array okay okay then However, we can't really see what psi is because now it is sparse array. And you see, as the way it's stored, it just tells which elements are non zero. So, if, however, you want to convert it back, what you need to do is just to type normal, right? And then it will be a normal matrix, as we saw before. Um, so, it is almost uh, you can operate with this sparse array the same way as you operate uh, with matrices in most uh, situations. But look at this now. So you see it now works a um, billion of times faster. So, okay. So now we are ready. You see, even we can easily go to 20. Problemo. Oh, you see, just uh, one second, maybe even 24. Okay, let's not get too ambitious. All right. So now what's the plan? Now we uh, we will have to define the Hamiltonian. So what it counts is that we need to, um, as you know from the lecture, the Hamiltonian is a binomial combinations of fermions of the type we defined here, multiplied by some random numbers which are normally distributed. So we need to know now how to make uh, uh, normally distributed numbers with a particular dispersion. So the way to do that is to uh, use predefined function. So normal variate, and then you say it's normal, very random, and then you say normal distribution. And by default, I think it's zero one. So zero mean uh, variation one. Um, and then it gives us the number. So now we actually want not just one of them, right? We want like 10 of them. All right, so for that, we can just write how many we want. And uh, furthermore, we can also increase, increase the precision if we want each number to have lots of digits. That's how we do that. All right, so now what we'll do, we need just to know how many um, uh, how many random coefficients we need, and we need, uh, roughly speaking, uh, n, well, n times n of them, right? So n times n, so I won't just write uh, ds n, comma n, and then I get a square, the matrix uh, of the random coefficients. So this will be my couplings. And uh, also remember that this is the case q equals 2, 
which means uh, there are only uh, there are only two fermions in this Lagrangian just to be begin with and I will also use this gothic J uh, for the strands of the coupling overall and the way it enters is through the dispersion relation which uh, I would rather copy then type and this is actual general formula which is true for any Q okay so now the problem is simple i just need to follow um the paper all the notations are there and just take all this couplings multiply by my fermions which we already pre-computed and and some so however it is an order some um, of this type. Right. Okay, so you see, however, it again gives us this parse array, but there is no much uh, point in that really because now it's almost this, um, uh, almost done. So I just convert it to normal right away. And this is my Hamiltonian. And now we can do eigenvalues. And, uh, okay. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Because why? Because I suspect. Because. because. So I had to restart. So basically, the problem is that I stupidly asked for 100 digit precision, and then this age it has 100 digit precision. So Mathematica is trying to compute 4,000, uh, 4, how many? Um, lots of eigenvalues, right? Because we actually at 24. Okay, let's not go crazy. Let's go 20. Um, so it's. Ten, tens of thousands of eigenvalues with precision of uh, 100 digits. That's a little bit too much. So I have to set it to the uh, machine precision by slash slash n and then eigenvalues should work nicely. So next what I do is sort them um, just to order them. And this will be my eigenvalues. All right, and then I can just use by the way, uh, so I do the slash slash something, but you equally well can just do standard brackets like that, right? Or as you remember, you can write add. Right? This is all kind of the same. All right, so that's the distribution of the eigenvalues. And you see, it's not actually semicircle as you would expect because um, the eigenvalues actually differences of the eigenvalues, which are distributed uh, as a semicircle, uh, but the eigenvalues of H, which are differences of the semicircle type distribution, they are not uh, semicircle type distributions. Themselves, but I'm, I'm sure Damien will explain this for you much better than I just done. Okay, dokie. So uh, next, uh, we are ready to do. Uh, Q equals four. Q equals four. So um, that's pretty much similar. And I will just copy some code so that I don't um, bother you with my explanation. All right, here it is. Just to emphasize some differences. Now we have actually uh, couplings um, which are tensor with four indices. So that's why I generate um, this tensor with four indices this way. The dispersion is uh, according to the general formula as before. And then Hamiltonian, so I just found it to work a bit faster if I first convert uh, a pair of indices, three and four, and then multiply by another binomial in uh, fermions. Just a little observation, uh, I'm sure you can. Explain it. 
all right so this this one uh let me explain that what it does it just uh in, in real time shows you what mathematica is doing that's quite useful for long calculations okay and in, in real time uh, shows you values of this indices i1 i2 i3 i4 but now it's already done and we are ready to compute the spectrum all right so that's all about the spectrum and what we do next uh, is to compute two-point function all right so we'll compute two-point function explicitly and then uh, we'll also solve integral equation quickly and compare them all right so not nothing very uh, significant from the mathematic point of view uh, here so two-point function uh, is a correlator in time and uh, we introduce finite temperature um, so uh, our time range is from zero to one or from minus one half to plus one half <clears throat> then okay we need to remember to get rid of this hungry digit uh, nonsense which i introduced earlier uh, another important thing i just introduced this memorization trick right you probably saw in some other videos uh, that's so that once you compute this function uh, it will remember its value and it's much quicker next time when you call the function with the same arguments um and then what else so this is just evolution operator and uh, i have to take two fermions evolve them to the right position in time and then uh, trace for the uh, for the uh, correlation function uh, for the thermal correlator right so this is our two-point function and hopefully so a and b are uh, which fermions we correlate so uh, one quarter beta is just one lambda is okay whatever one as well all right so it does give something and finally we can uh, so see just to make a point so second time i evaluate it's immediate right because i use this memorization but first time is not so fast so look again so timing if i add timing it takes 10 seconds if i remove timing uh, no, it's not I removed time. Second time you evaluate is much quicker. That's the point I was trying to make, but failed apparently. Anyway, so now I just want to make a plot. Okay, ignore all this. Okay. So uh, again, I use this dynamic P to see uh, where time is running. Uh, so I just take index A to be 1, index B to be 1. Time is running between minus one half plus one half. Uh, beta, the tem inverse temperature is one, and the coupling is one. All right, so we have this uh, values, and we can make a plot like that. So I mean, that's a bit fancy way of doing that. You can also just simply write this and remove the same percent. So, I mean, you can, if you have more spare time, uh, you can put one quarter here, but it will take some time to generate. So, here it is, our lovely uh, two point correlator. And uh, now we are going to reproduce it uh, by using integral equation, which is derived in the infinite and limit. All right, I hope you are ready for the final part uh, of this episode. Uh, namely, we will solve now the Schwinger-Dyson equation numerically. So the Schwinger-Dyson equation, uh, which I'm sure uh, will be explained on the lecture, uh, can be written the following way. So it's convenient to write one of the equations in the Fourier space. So omega refers to Fourier uh, space. And another equation is nicely uh, written in the coordinate space tau, right? So um, they're related one to another by a Fourier series. And the Fourier series um, is basically due to the temperature 
uh, the function should be periodic, but in our case, uh, they actually anti-periodic, as you can see from the plot here. Uh, the two-point function is uh, changes the sign after we go around the uh, time circle. Uh, because of that, expansion in Fourier series goes in half integer modes, and otherwise it's all uh, quite standard. <clears throat> so the way we solve this equation is by iterations. At the zero iteration, starting point is when sigma is zero, and then g is just uh, one uh, i over omega, which is a Fourier transform of one half of sine of tau, uh, just a free propagator. Then uh, we plug this sign um, to the right hand side of the second equation to find sigma of tau. Uh, and then once we know sigma of tau, we have to Fourier transform into sigma of omega uh, to compute the next approximation for g. And in this way, we go around until it converges. So it's guaranteed to converge if uh, uh, j is small enough, uh, at least. And if it's not small enough, then you have to um, do something uh, to help it con uh, to converge. Uh, and there are different techniques, and uh, we won't have really time to <clears throat> discuss them. So one of the important tricks is uh, when writing and G is to uh, be sure that we deal with smooth functions. So the smooth functions, you see this one actually had discontinuities. However, if we remove the free part, then uh, you can convince yourself it will be like very smooth uh, function uh, and uh, the discontinuity um, will disappear if, if you subtract uh, one half of sine of tau from G. All right, so now uh, about the implementation, uh, it goes as follows. First, first let me include uh, just uh, clean G and Sigma. So I introduce uh, function G and Sigma, and I want to be sure that they will uh, be erased each time I uh, run my code. <clears throat> so, uh, I have actually G and G tau. So G tau re uh, relates to G of tau in coordinate space and both G uh, and sigma themselves as they would be in Fourier space. So then the starting point is quite simple. Uh, um, I just put sigma all its Fourier components to zero. So the syntax is the following. The first argument of, of sigma or of G will refer to the iteration number, and the second argument will refer to the Fourier component. So I want, by, by writing this, I want all Fourier components at the zero iteration to be zero, okay? Then I can, after that, solve the second equation. This is just an algebraic equation, so it doesn't cost me anything. <clears throat> Well, I mean, all the substitute business, I can actually have written it explicitly here, but just to make it um, nicer. Um, so literally, this is implementation of this equation. There is nothing tricky. So the tricky thing is uh, with this equation, because now we have to actually go into back into the coordinate space. So in order to go to the coordinate space, we know what to do. The only think is, as I explained, it's better to split into smooth part and into discontinu discontinuous part. And all discontinuity sits in the uh, free propagator, whereas the rest, this different, is a smooth function. So uh, it's Fourier coefficients, uh, the difference of the uh, reading order and current iterations, they, they should decay pretty fast, right? So for the expansion of a smooth function, it's a factorially right, conversion. Um, <clears throat> and lambda is something uh, I forgot to mention, is a cutoff. And of course, if it's uh, convergent fast, then we don't need to keep too many orders. And you can experiment with this cutoff later on. All right, so this equation is just a Fourier transform from sigma, uh, from g of omega to g of tau. 
that's it. And now we are ready to close uh, our set of equations because we just uh, can Fourier transform the right hand side of this equation to obtain sigma of omega, right? So let me just copy it again. That's how it looked like, right? So that's the right hand side we recognize is um, integral computes its uh, Fourier coefficients. And that's all, right? So we are ready to check whether it works. So let's begin from just zero iteration. Uh, oh, one quarter, say, let's compute zero iteration of G of our uh, propagator at point tau equal to one quarter, right? As expected, it is one half just because it's the free propagator. So now we can check whether the uh, first order, the first iteration gives us something non trivial. You see, it did work. Uh, it's slightly further away from one half, so we should keep iterating. All right, get something else. And here, yeah, let me just jump to order 10. And you see, uh, because I use memorization trick, uh, second time I evaluate, it's of course instantaneous. So in particular, I can just make an actual plot to just convince ourselves that it's convergent from zero to 10, right? Um, oops, it's failed somehow. I ran it real part, indeed. Uh, so you see, okay, first is one half, then it jumps quite a lot, but it converges pretty well. So uh, we can trust, it seems, tense iteration, and that's it. So finally, the final test, we now can solve uh, this two-point function completely in the theory at n infinite, right? Uh, at the same time, we have our numerical direct diagonalization, kind of, of the Hamiltonian at finite but large n. n is uh, 20, if I remember. Right, yeah, at 20, but you can push it uh, further, uh, which we saw it would work uh, up to at least 24, maybe even more. I didn't try. Uh, and so let's see whether it works. So you see it's pretty well uh, fit one another. So here's a dashed line correspond to our uh, Schwinger Dyson equation. And the solid line is. Uh, the direct diagonalization result. All right, so uh, as an exercise, uh, I would recommend you to also reproduce um, uh, this plot, match with the previous method, and also play with parameters, try to stronger coupling limit when uh, J is bigger or J is smaller and see um, how it works. And there are more results from the lecture you can uh, try to reproduce in this way. So thank you very much. Uh, that's the end of this episode and see you next year soon, I hope. Bye.